This is a country that may be liberated, but it's far from being safe. The attack on the U.S. consulate on Tuesday isn't all that surprising when considering the country's deep security issues. And here's just a few examples of what's been going on there in the last few months. Now, back in May, fighters attacked government headquarters in the capital, Tripoli, killing one security guard. In June, rival militias fought over the country's main airport. It was eventually handed back to the government. In August, Sufi shrines came under attack by ultra-conservative Salafis. The government was blamed for failing to protect the minority group. And earlier this month, a car bombing killed an intelligence officer in Benghazi, the same city where the U.S. ambassador was killed. Let's now speak to Jeff Porter, who's a risk consultant who specializes in North Africa. He joins us live from New York. Jeff, good to talk to you. Now, the U.S. authorities, Jeff, are saying they can't establish yet a direct link between this anti-Islam film and the protests at the consulate in Benghazi, suggesting perhaps perhaps that this attack may have been planned and organized. What is your take on this? This happened, of course, on 9-11. Could this have been the hallmark of an organized attack, or was it, in your opinion, a spontaneous eruption by a mob? Well, I I think there may have been two things taking place. I think there may have been a component that was spontaneous, but I also do think that there was a component that was planned. the U.S. consular section in Benghazi was attacked before. It was attacked on the 6th of June. The day before that attack, the U.S. government had announced that Abu Yahya Libi, an al-Qaeda leader, was killed in Afghanistan and Pakistan by a U.S. drone. The, so the day following the death of Abu Yahya Libi, the U.S. consular section in Benghazi was attacked. September 11th, Ayman Zawahiri announced that Abu Yahya Libi had in fact been killed, something he had heretofore denied. The same day, later that same day, the U.S. consular section in Benghazi is attacked yet again. So I do think that there is a strong argument to make that this was a planned attack. Mm. Now, I understand, Jeff, that you briefed the ambassador back in May about security in Libya. What was the risk assessment for diplomats in Libya? Well, Ambassador Stevens, I think, had a realistic assessment of the risks he was going to face in Libya when he assumed his post. Um, But at the time, it's important to note that The security environment in Libya was bad, but it was predictable. Uh, There was militia fighting, there was tribal fighting, there was regional fighting, but all of it was relatively predictable and relatively conventional. We didn't have terrorism per se. That began to change over the course of the summer, and I'm sure Ambassador Stevens was well appraised of the risks he faced. Mm. So what precisely was the level of security at the consulate in Benghazi, and what was... Uh, was there any early warning system? In other words, were they prepared for such an incident? Well, the, the, the consular section in Benghazi is, is relatively unique among U.S. diplomatic institutions or uh, around the world. Uh, since 2011, uh, since September 11, 2001, a lot of U.S. embassies and diplomatic installations around the world have been revamped, rebuilt. Mm. They've had their security protocols reinforced. That didn't happen in Libya. Diplomatic ties were only reestablished with Libya in 2006. So it was very difficult for the United States to implement the security protocols at its embassies and consular sections that it, in Libya that it had elsewhere around the world. Mm. So was there then a breakdown in security at the consulate? Talk us through, Jeff, because you're an expert on this. Talk us through what happens in these situations when there's a perceived threat on the mission. What's the protocol? Aren't officials... Uh, supposed to be taken to a safe location when there's a perceived threat on the mission? What happens in these circumstances? Well, it it, it appears as if security protocol was followed at the consular section. Um, Ambassador Stevens was taken to a safe room, uh, but there seems to have been a a, a technical breakdown or some sort of perimeter breach uh, that resulted in the assailants entering the compounds um, we are hearing initial reports that the compound came under a coordinated mortar assault, um, which seems to have indicated, you know, further cor- corroborates the view that there was this, this, this was a planned attack. Mm. Now, Ambassador Stevens didn't die from a wound or a gunshot. Instead, it appears as if he had died from smoke inhalation due to a failure of the ventilation system in the safe room in which he, had, in, in which he was hiding. Okay. Uh, just, just one last question, and just to clarify for our viewers, uh, why is it that it was Libyan forces guarding the embassy in the first place? And is this the case in other U.S. missions around the world? 
Yes, it is the case at other U.S. missions around the world. Um, there is always a local force component to U.S. Uh, to the security at U.S. embassies around the world. There is a, 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 a representation from the U.S. military forces at US, U.S. diplomatic installations, but local security does provide most of the security at, at, these, at these embassies and consular sections. Mm. And, and just one last question, Jeff, if I can. Now, we're hearing now that there are uh, two warships that are possibly heading towards the Libyan coast. I mean, what could that entail? What are we looking at here, you think? Well, first, I think it's a it's a show of force um, that that it sends a clear signal that the U.S. military presence is going to be intensified in Libya as a consequence of the death of uh, of its ambassador there. But th there may also be a a logistical component if the security situation continues to deteriorate at a rapid rate. Uh, the U.S. citizens currently in Libya will be able to be evacuated on the warships if that need arises. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff, for speaking to us. This uh, North Africa risk consultant, Jeff Porter, joining us there live from New York. Thanks for your insight. Now, the video sharing website YouTube says it has now blocked the film from being shown in Egypt and in Libya after the violence there. This anti-Islam film is said to be two hours long, but only snippets have been available online for several days now. It's called Innocence of Muslims and allegedly costs five million dollars to make. It portrays the life of the Prophet Muhammad and depicts him as approving of child sex abuse. Now, the writer and director of the film is said to be a man who calls himself Sam Basil from California. But there's growing suspicion that the name may be a cover for a group of right-wing Christians. And a man claiming to be the director told a news agency he was an Israeli Jew and described Islam as a cancer. Well, Max Blumenthal is an author and journalist. He says the film is a result of links between Egypt's cops and right-wing Christians in the United States. The operation behind this film appears to be extreme Egyptian Copts who want to discredit the Morsi government in Egypt and create a provocation there, who oppose the revolution, aligned with Christian right groups who have an apocalyptic uh, theocratic agenda and who um, are inciting against Muslim Americans. So it's these kind of events that really turn the screws on Islamophobia in the United States. And they put Muslims in the United States in danger. They're putting Copts in Egypt in danger. And they're putting U.S. diplomats in danger. And they're a detriment to U.S. foreign policy. That's what's not going to be said in the United States, is that these Christian right elements, which wave the American flag, which are so jingoistic, are actually putting American foreign um, service officials in danger and getting them killed.